great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sonia Vallov, and this is Eric Minical. And thanks so much for having us talk today about our personal quest to develop a treatment for prion diseases. Um, so here are some extremely boring affiliations or uh, disclosures. Um, and here's sort of where our story begins. So this is me and Sonia getting married in 2009, uh, happiest day of our lives. And um, looking back on it, it's funny to think, you know, when this picture was taken, we definitely thought that we had the big three questions in life figured out. We lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We were very happy there. We knew who we were going to spend the rest of our life with, each other. Um, and we had our careers all sorted out. So I was in school for city planning, and Sonia was in law school. And it's funny to look back and realize, uh, you know, some of those things we, sure enough, did have figured out, and other things we just had no idea what was about to happen to us. So this is a picture of my mom helping me get ready that day. She was really the animating force behind our wedding. She organized everything. She was very happy that day, and she was healthy. Um, but about six months after this photo was taken, so at the beginning of 2010, her health took this disastrous turn. And at first, this showed up in small ways, um, problems with her memory, with her weight, her coordination, her judgment, um, her eyesight. But all of these dots then started to connect very rapidly in a way that was, that was terrifying. So two months after these first symptoms, she had descended into a dementia where she couldn't finish a sentence, she couldn't communicate clearly at all. She really couldn't recognize us a lot of the time. And she had lost so much muscle mass that she couldn't walk or move independently. And then fast forward another two months, she had gone into a series of hospital stays that lasted until the end of her life. Um, very quickly, she came to be on life support um, and spent several months akinetic and mute in hospital. And then at the end of 2010, she died. So through this whole odyssey, we had no diagnosis, despite taking her you know, sort of all across the country looking for one. It was only from her autopsy that we learned that she had died of a genetic prion disease. And bundled into that diagnosis was this idea that her disease was genetic. And I was at 50-50 risk of having inherited the mutation that had killed her. Um, so here's a picture of us deciding whether to get genetic <laughs> testing. <laughs> um, so actually, for us, it was no decision. You know, um, I guess Sonia and I are both just the personality type where we had to know. You know. If there was a way that we could find out if Sonia had this genetic variant from her mother, we had to know immediately. So you know, very quickly, Sonia got blood drawn, sent it off for testing. We waited an agonizing two months for the test results to come back, and then we had the answer. So here's the punchline. It was not the result we had hoped for. Um, so right here locally at Brigham and Women's Hospital, we were handed this piece of paper from which we learned that I had, in fact, inherited my mom's disease mutation. And nothing about that is good news, of course. So uh, prion diseases are rapid neurodegenerative diseases. Um, for Sonia's mutation, onset has been seen anywhere from age 18 to 80, with a mean somewhere around 50. Um, and then from first symptom to death is quite rapid, usually about six months. And then, as now, there's no prevention, treatment, or cure for these diseases, which leads a lot of people to say, why get genetic testing? There's nothing you can do. So this launched what we've come to think of as the, the seven stages of coping with the genetic test result. And the first stage is a very humble one. We sat down at our kitchen table with our laptops, and we Googled the word prion. And our goal here was just to understand the most sort of at the most basic level, what is this disease? What do we know about it? What are we up against? Um, pretty quickly, that led to a desire to learn more than we could get just from Wikipedia. Um, in particular, a friend came over with a thumb drive full of scientific papers and said, guys, science has answers for you. There's people working on this. I want you to have hope. Um, that was hard to accept at first, and the papers were incredibly hard to understand at first. Um, but, but we started looking at them anyway, and we, we got inspired that actually there was hope for a therapy within our lifetime. Um, this led us to you know, read as much as we could read. We enrolled in night classes at Harvard Extension School. Sonia started sitting in on classes at MIT. Um, and we were basically running all around town doing everything we could to educate ourselves on this subject. Around this time, Eric started blogging at CureFFI.org. This is an ongoing enterprise. Um, and it started mostly as a way for him to sort of keep track of the things we were learning, communicate with me, and communicate with our other friends, our scientist friends who were helping us get up to speed on biology. Um, but very quickly, it 
came to be something else. Uh, we found that Eric would write a post sort of summarizing his thoughts on a recent paper in the prion field, and the people who had done the work would come across the post and reach out to us. And this, like, the internet's amazing. This is how we basically came to know everyone in the prion field within about a year. Um, also, pr pretty early on, we actually changed careers. So about three months after the genetic test report, Sonia had quit her job in consulting and had taken an entry-level stem cell technician job at, at Mass General Hospital. So this is her culturing cells under the hood. Um, I followed just a few months after that. I got a, a job in bioinformatics also at MGH. So, um, you know, we were kind of in that state of working on science, but not prion science as our day job, and then thinking about our disease in evenings and weekends uh, for about two years. As we started to sort of formulate the ambition to shift to working on our disease full time, we started traveling, um, attending the prion conferences to chat with people, and also making sort of research visits to prion labs across the country and the world. And I have to say the people in the field were outrageously generous to us, taking us in for months at a time to train us on the techniques that are most relevant to our gene, protein, and disease of interest. Um, so then uh, about two and three quarters years into the quest, we enrolled in the PhD program in biological and biomedical sciences here at Harvard Medical School um, as you know, the next step in our education, and we hoped a way to actually get to work on our disease full time, which became the seventh stage. And this is us, sort of day to day. So we've landed in the Schreiber lab at the Broad Institute, um, where we work side by side. We're never more than about 10 feet apart. Um, and you know, this lab had not worked on prion disease before we showed up, but they got interested in our problem, and we've sort of opened a new project there. And this is where we'll be for the foreseeable future. So, um, in, you know, in some ways, what we've done is run the race to the starting line. Um, you know, we think of our last four years as kind of being our years in the wild, our time of trying to figure out how we could impact this disease, and now we're actually trying to have that impact. But we've at least come far enough to have a very different perspective now on the meaning of this genetic test report. So as you can imagine, when we first got this, it seemed like incalculably bad luck. So prion diseases are pretty uncommon. So it wasn't likely to end up being Sonia's mother's diagnosis, but it was. And then of prion diseases, only about 10% of cases are genetic. So that wasn't likely either, but this proved to be a genetic case. And then it came down to a coin flip, which also went the wrong way for us. So it seemed like we had some pretty bad luck. But uh, I think if our time in science has given us anything so far, it's sort of the perspective that actually we're incredibly lucky, and this piece of paper symbolizes that in, in a few ways. A lot of what people are doing right now with genetics is asking you know, both about rare diseases and common diseases at its most basic sort of mechanistic level. What is this disease? And the fact that someone was able to hand me a genetic test report means that for, for prion disease, that's known. So, we know, and actually have known for a long time, that these diseases are monogenic. They trace to a particular gene. That gene produces this particular protein, and that protein is able to take on this disease-causing activity. And because we have that in hand, we have a roadmap. We can sort of look at this protein's sort of life cycle and ask, what are the realistic points of intervention that we think could really have a benefit? And day to day, at the bench, the genetics is really like the blueprint for us. Um, and a second, maybe more philosophical way that we've come to see this test report as good luck is that, um, you know, everyone in this room is going to die someday, and most of us don't get any warning on when or how. Um, so the life that Sonia and I are living is in some ways a unique thing in all of human history, which is, you know, getting, you know, we don't know for sure what the age of onset is, but we hope getting 20 years advance notice on what our fate will be, and therefore an opportunity to try to change it not unlike the situation with Marty and Doc. Um, so, so wish us luck in that quest. Thanks so much. Two questions. Um, one is, uh, you guys have such an inspiring story, and 
how can people help uh, is one. Uh, and two is what was most surprising when you transitioned from being sort of a patient to a researcher about how biomedic research is done. Great. Um, so I guess on, uh, one of the surprises of science has been the ways in which science moves both fast and slow. So I think coming in, we, we always heard this mythology of, wow, science moves so fast. Every year it's changing. All the things we do today were impossible 15 years ago. Um, and I think we, it wasn't until we got into it that we realized that actually day to day, it's incredibly slow and frustrating. Like, it, you know, the, it's an aerial unit problem. If you look back at what you accomplished in any one week, you'll always be like, oh my God, how are we ever going to get to a treatment for this disease? If, you know, all we did this week was send something off for sequencing and it didn't even work, right? Um, but then if you zoom out to a larger time scale and look at what you've accomplished, it's actually, it's, it actually is amazing how fast things move. You just need to zoom out enough to see that. Um, other things to add on that theme? Um, gosh, I mean, something that we reflect on a lot is sort of the system that we have in place for scientific communication that is sort of like appropriate to the era of the printing press and maybe less appropriate to the era of the internet. And um, I think it really surprised us in the beginning that like as people without university affiliations coming in, we couldn't access many of the papers we wanted to read and had to get them through our university affiliated friends. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing sort of like an, an updating of that culture slowly, and I, I really look forward, as I'm sure everyone in this room does, to the day where um, there are fewer barriers to getting results and data out. Um, yeah, in, in, in terms of ways to help, um, I'll be honest, we need money. If you can help on that front, come approach us afterward. Uh, that's, that's always a concern. Um, you know, more broadly, how to help people in our position, I think, uh, Participating in research and taking data and sharing it widely is absolutely tremendous. You know, everything we've been able to do so far in our, you know, in our four years is thanks to people who have participated in research and been very open about saying, take my data and do whatever you want with it. Um, and we've been able to, you know, we've, we've been the benef beneficiaries of people's generosity in that respect. Um, and we've also been really lucky that science has a great culture of training, a culture of mentorship. Um, and people have been generous with their time. And a lot of people, when we were no one, you know, um, had no skills in this area and nothing, had, had not proved ourselves in any way, shape, or form, people took chances on us. So I encourage you to take chances on others who might be in our position. Thank you for your example to all of us who may have a genetic illness. And um, I wondered if you have been able to find um, the um, triggers that begin the onset of that genetic component and or if you have discovered any uh, means of prevention at this point? Um, so right now there's, I think we don't, we don't know anything about how to, we have theories of how we could develop therapeutics to prevent prion disease, but we don't have anything in hand. Um, nor do we know of any sort of lifestyle changes that one can make to prevent prion disease. Um, in terms of, sorry, the other part of your question was, oh, what triggers the disease? So it's, it's a great question. I'm producing the mutant protein right now. Why is it, you know, years or decades until onset for most people where it occurs in midlife? I think right now we really have no idea. And the, the age of onset ranges so widely. We don't see it in childhood, but really any time in adulthood it can strike. Um, and I, I wonder, so people have you know, sort of looked for, for genetic, other genetic modifiers besides PRNP that might influence age of onset, besides the prion protein gene. We haven't found anything there. I don't think we have great data sets to query environmental triggers, um, but so far, I think on both of those fronts, we have no idea. Keep looking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I really love your guys' story because um, um, you guys came from a completely different background than biomedical research, but just said, you know what, I'm going to do this. And, and like, I also went from astrophysics to metabolic genetics because I've got a family history at it, and I just finally hit this point where I'm like, you know, screw it, I'm going to do it myself. Um, but what I also found is that it was incredibly hard once I hit grad school to become accepted because I was educated in a completely different field and people did not want me in their lab. 
Um, so what I'm wondering is if we can drive some kind of cultural shift where we really convince people that they really can make a shift, they really can adopt a new career path, but then, the, then it's a matter of matchmaking those people to the right people in the biomedical establishment that will take them. And I'd love to hear your opinions on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess my, my opinion is I agree. It's a, it's a challenge and it is a cultural evolution that needs to happen. I think, you know, in, in part we were lucky when all of this happened to us. We lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There were so many scientists around that we were able to find the people who were willing to take, take a chance on us. And it certainly wasn't everyone, right? Um, so, yeah, matching the, the scientists who are passionate and are, you know, have, have outside expertise and need to learn the biology with the people who are willing to take a chance on them, I think, is, is really critical. Um, given that you are overall more concerned with the, the cure than with building a scientific career, does this change your way to scientific publications? Do you publish more, less, more frequently, less frequently, smaller papers, bigger papers, put everything on the website? Do you have any recommendations how we can uh, be kind of more pushing things forward if we put kind of the career building thing a bit to the back? Um, yeah, I, I would say like our, if, if we could just follow our hearts, we would blog everything. We're not always in a position to do that because when, where we're collaborating with others, they of course have, you know, everybody has multiple sort of interests, even if your heart is in absolutely the right place, you may need to, you know, follow the, the wishes of your department or colleagues or, or lab or university. Um, so there's such a sort of complicated constellation of different people involved in all of these projects and different institutions that we can't always go directly to the web with everything we do. Um, I think one way in which we hope to be uh, different than you know, some examples we've seen is um, we'll do lots of stuff that doesn't work and all of that stuff that's not publication worthy, I hope that we will put on the internet so that other people can learn from those mistakes. And I think sharing negative results is an area where you know, the biological community has a tremendous distance to go so that we don't keep reinventing the wheel. Uh, what would you say? I agree. I think it, it's funny to ask us, like, do we publish more or less? I think we don't yet have enough data to say. 